We're now going to turn to our third segment for the webinar, to capacity building in culturally safe practice, and in particular, the need for more integration and partnerships between settlement, multicultural, and family violence services. So our key insights for action in this area are introduce cultural safety training and service partnerships to build capacity across settlement services, mainstream family violence services, and law enforcement agencies, as well as support by cultural workers through individual safety plans, culturally safe management practices, and professional opportunities. We have a video example from the Safer Pathways Project at Ballarat Community Health about these insights. It also includes comments from two members of the project's reference group who supported its implementation. If you have a question for the panel on capacity building, please submit it now. We'll also have some time for taking general questions after the video. Hello, this is Leslie McCartney from Ballarat Community Health. I'm leading the Safer Pathways for Refugee and Immigrant Women in Ballarat and Western Victoria project, which is part of the Cold Power Initiative. Our project has worked on capacity building in the areas of cultural safety and cultural humility with a range of agencies and services, including um, training sessions for health service staff, non-governmental community services and staff from law enforcement agencies. We completed a detailed training needs and gap analysis to inform the rollout of professional development workshops. And through this analysis, we identified gaps among service providers uh, in navigating the service system, the family violence service system, in family violence referral networks and inter-agency arrangements for refugee and immigrant women at risk or experiencing family violence, as well as in trauma-informed care for this cohort. We also consulted with women from a range of commun uh, diverse communities in Ballarat and discovered that there was a universal understanding that family violence meant physical violence, but there was virtually no understanding of other forms of family violence. So there was also a lack of awareness among women and girls that help was available for family violence. We knew we had a lot of work to do uh, to improve awareness of the types of family violence and how and where to seek help with this community. So attending service network meetings and persisting in bringing up the importance of cultural safety and cultural humility training uh, was important for getting organisational buy-in um, for the training to take place. Ballarat Community Health partnered with the Multicultural Centre for Women's Health uh, in Melbourne, another Cold Power project organisation, to provide culturally safe facilitation of some of our community education events uh, to increase awareness of family violence and services. MCWH also contributed to workplace cultural competency workshops. We also developed a localised service provider directory uh, for the local health district and a family violence referral flowchart, which we then uh, shared with health service providers and other uh, mainstream services, um, as well as the local primary health network, um, Western Victoria Primary Health Network in both Central Highlands and Wimmera districts. Some service providers were very receptive to our work and others took a bit longer to take on our key messages. However, the work of capacity building is important for planting the seed of future work to address culturally safe practices among stakeholders in the family violence sector. I'm Marianne Hendron, the CEO at Women's Health Grampians. The Ballarat and Western Victoria Safer Pathways project has contributed significantly to building capacity amongst agencies in this region around intersectionality and cultural safety. In particular, it has engaged really well with um, agencies and key services in the western part of this region, the more rural and remote areas where migrant and refugee women are particularly isolated and vulnerable. So this has been very much welcomed. It's been fantastic working with the Safer Pathways project in the Central Highlands region. Um, I chaired the reference group for this project and a whole group of different agencies came together who had never really come together before in this way to work out the best way as a region to be able to respond in, to family violence for refugee and immigrant women. So part of the project was that the whole region built capacity to be able to respond to refugee and immigrant women. It wasn't just agency focused. 
I'm also the Risk Family Violence Support Agency Executive Officer. And because of that, I was also able to influence the staff at my organisation to be able to respond in a way and to be able to have better access to refugee and immigrant women, women in relation to family violence. And this included um, developing some policies and procedures around this, working out how to use interpreter services in a much better and appropriate way. We also had students um, in this 2019 who were from refugee and immigrant backgrounds. So that really built our capacity and confidence in this area. Thanks to Ballarat Community Health and their advisory group members, highlighting the importance of mobilising through networks and training sessions to build capacity in culturally safe practice across regions. Catherine, your project in particular worked with Leslie at Ballarat Community Health, among other partners. Can you tell us a little bit about how your project delivery model worked with networks of services in different regional locations? Yes, um, so as we said we are based in Melbourne, um, so we aim to build the expertise of, or sorry, build on the expertise of community health multi and multicultural organizations in regional areas. And our work is more sustainable when we add value to the work that's already being done there and not trying to duplicate anything that's being done in the area. Um, so as Leslie said in the video, in Ballarat we partnered with Ballarat Community Health to facilitate community education events as part of our safer. Um, both of our safer passage projects. Um, and in our work in Ballarat, as well as in Bendigo, Swan Hill, and Mildura, we conducted training needs analysis for service providers and tailored training um, to build the capacity of services to work equitably with migrant communities. Um, and talking about building trust, it was um, much more effective to travel to the regional areas for face to face meetings rather than um, just speaking on the phone or, or sending emails before delivering education sessions or training. Um, and I think it's also important to note that there are prevention um, contributors or the kind of, um, I think what's said in the Cold Paw report is accidental helpers. And so we also looked at in areas where there weren't necessarily special services or the multicultural services were overbooked or, um, you know, whatever made it difficult to coordinate in certain areas, we would also look at building the capacity of local councils and mainstream services, um, and even university and state staff working with international students, for example. Fantastic. Thanks for bringing uh, that issue of accidental workers to uh, the fore as well. And in the training and capacity building your project carried out, what was the difference between focusing on cultural safety rather than the other frameworks like cultural competence that are out there? Yeah, so that's at the core of all of the work we do at Multicultural Center for Women's Health. And um, Leslie touched on that as well in, in her video. But basically, cultural safety or humility is about focusing on the systems and structures of power that impact people's lives. So that could include, um, in the case of migrant women and men, the migration system, um, the availability of information in language, um, access to transportation and other services. And um, we really like to emphasize that you can't know a person by assuming or making um, cultural stereotypes or presumptions that reduce people to a culture um, based on whether it's their language or nationality or faith. Um, and that we should always be considering what are the different uh, forces at play that influence people's lives. And especially in a response sense, um, fully listening to a person and, and understanding what, what it is that makes people feel afraid or feel safe and what, you know, allows them to make informed choices for themselves. Thanks, Catherine. And I know that MCWH has been quite innovative with how it's put into place workplace structures to support its bicultural workers. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Um, yep, so I won't go too much into the challenges that um, bilingual and bicultural workers when working in prevention, but I know that the um, Calls PAR report does do that. But um, it's really important that organizations support bilingual workers as integral employees of an organization. Um, so they're not add-ons to an organization. They're not called on just as needed um, responsibly, but really that um, bicultural and bilingual workers contribute a 
significant amount to an organization as a whole and also needs very specific support in their in their roles because of the unique circumstances. Um, so, for example, some ways that we can support bilingual workers and bicultural workers is to agree on really clear boundaries around what their role entails and what it doesn't entail. So, for example, if they're not working in response or counseling or even in interpreting, then that's not what should be expected of them by the organization or by the community that they're working with. Um, and also being able to keep clear boundaries around their working and non-working hours if they are part of a community that they're working with. And also co-creating risk management strategies. So um, that could involve having flexible um, employment policies and, and making sure that there's debriefing time um, and planning meetings for and after um, contracted work or education sessions, for example, and ensuring that um, workers are equitably paid for their time, um, including that preparation and debrief time, and also celebrating the work that they do and, and showcasing their work on social media and supporting their career advancement and recognition, um, because a lot of bicultural and bilingual workers might be working for multiple organizations at once uh, due to the, the um, casual nature of that kind of role currently. Um, and finally, I just want to say that it's really important that um, people don't like, like I said before about cultural humility, that people don't conflate um, a person speaking a certain language, meaning that they have similar views to or belief systems as, as the people they're working with in a community, um, and that perspectives on gender equality and people's experiences are very diverse um, within and across cultures.